You know what they say it means when a Baptist pastor looks at his watch? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I don't think the Jews are any too different. <laughs> but I promise not to keep it till midnight. Only till 11.59. Okay, so are we good? <laughs> and welcome. Shabbat shalom. Lord bless you both. Glad to see you. Missing Riley, but glad to see you too. Anyway, anyway. It is exciting. It's a new place. We have a cloud race. We have followed the cloud. We think the cloud has settled. We're in the mountaintop. We've been in the mountaintop, have we not? We finally made it. We made it to Shabbat. We counted and we counted and we counted and we finally made it to Shabbat. And technically, it did end at sundown yesterday. So it, it really is over. But that's just bringing in our first fruits. That's just coming to our day of Jubilee. That's not over. That's just the beginning. It's really just the beginning. And our scripture often gives us in different ways, different pictures. It teaches us and it brings us reminders. So as I prepared for this evening, the Lord didn't take me out of Jubilee. He kept me in Jubilee. He took me into Zachariah, Zechariah, our prophet. He had a great vision, and I'm going to shorten this so that we can fit it in, but I know, I'm sorry, but you can read it. Oh, oh, I have all night. You heard that out of Bruce's mouth. <laughs> you heard it. There is no box. That's why I borrowed Emily's watch. <laughs> are, they, are they turning the air off at a certain time to get us out? <laughs> Wow. 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 That's dangerous. <laughs> I can get wound up and totally lose track of time. I can, uh, I'm can. i sure that there are others here also really the same way. But I'll tell you what, what I am referencing. It comes from Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 4. The vision is in verses 1 through 10. And he saw this. Well, to me, it was a, a huge menorah. It's over six feet tall, so that's tall for, for me, okay? <laughs> the menorah had seven pipes, which led to seven lamps. And even when we look at our Hebrew, there are those who say, that's 49 pipes, that there were seven pipes leading to each of the lamps. There are others that say, no, 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 that was one for each, it's just seven. Seven being the complete number and perfection. But I tend to think that it was more that we are looking at 49. We're looking at, okay, uh -oh. I was looking for it earlier, Bruce. It, it found its way home. It was, it was waiting for the vision. <laughs> and it's not quite six feet because I can look at almost a eyeball, but that's okay. <laughs> You're higher. <laughs> Uh, but we do see, even in 49, and why I was excited and why I saw it is, remember when we counted the almond? We get to 49, and then what happens? Jubilee. So even in this, I think we're seeing a picture of Jubilee. And this earth shall we use it not? <laughs> <laughs> we have sound effects, we have light music, we have the roof to raise, and this time we've got to work harder to raise our roof. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. Don't worry about it. Only God is perfect. And in his perfection, what we are seeing in the numbers, what we are seeing in the sevens, we do see the perfection of God. In the perfection of God, we see the spirit of God. He's never early, he's never late, he's always right on time, and he leads, and that's what I love, is he leads. And this menorah, it was the spiritual light. When we see it in the tabernacle, and we see that we're camping in the shape of the, the cross, we see that we're facing toward our tabernacle, we know that's the central focus, we haven't left that behind. And when we think about the menorah in the holy place, do you realize no one on the outside could see that. The priests working in there and going into the Holy of Holies when it was that one time a year to do that were the only ones that would see it. And yet that light enabled those priests to do the service of God. They were able to 
perform the tasks they were supposed to perform. I, I guess I can say I don't like that word perform, but the light was not to be used for any profane matters. It was only to be used in the holy place and in service to the God, to our God, to the God of Israel. And when you look at that menorah, you get into the detail. And if I had known I had till midnight, I would have brought you this detail too, but instead I just hit the highlight. It is a beautiful picture of Yeshua. When you get into how it was beaten, made out of gold and all that comes together. And as we referenced earlier, Yeshua is the light of the world. And that's what this is representing. That light enlightened everyone. The light that was burning in Zechariah's dream, this menorah was not in the holy place. It was just simply a menorah that he saw. But it was burning because it had feeding it pure and beaten olive oil. By the time olive oil has been beaten out, all of the, the sediment, everything is gone, and you're left with nothing but the pure. And that's why even in that, we're getting a picture here, because Yeshua, our light giver, the mm -hmm. source of life, the life that gives life, that life we can have because it stems from him. He is our light. He provides for us. He supports us. He's our sustenance. He's our illumination. He sustains us. He upholds our lives. And I've only just begun. It's all about that light. It's all about Yeshua. And that oil that flows from the central shaft fed all those other pipes. It was as if that was the shamash. And remember at Hanukkah, we learned about the shamash, the light that bent down to bring the light into the hearts of the others. Made me think of our prophet Yeshahu Isaiah, chapter 2, and verse 5. Oh, house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is a picture. This is the, the Zachariah's, Zachariah's vision. This is... It's, to me, it's so interesting to see the six foot, actually they say six foot three tall, 100 pounds of beaten gold, all of, uh, uh, menorah, sorry. <laughs> but next to it is why I got tongue twisted. Next to it were two olive trees, one on the left, one on the right. We're in verse three of chapter four now. And the vision's candlestick was very different from the temple. It was different because it had that central reservoir. It was different because it had seven pipes supplying. And when we look at it in the vision, there is no human that uh, agency that is supplying this oil to light this menorah. Now in the temple, you didn't have, you had one seven branch, you had the middle that the rest branch out from, but the priests would light every individual one, and they lit them day and they lit them night. Uh, remember I told you before, the wicks were from the high priest garments that had worn out. They would take them and shred them and make wicks out of their, their garments. But this central reservoir fed all of them. There was no intervention by man. There's no hand of man in this at all. It's strictly and completely lit by our God. And it burned through the night. It burned in the temple, burned through the night. It was a symbol of the nation of God, which the light, when you come into the light, you come into that spiritual understanding. And then you are to shine that light out. You are to shine before the Lord first, and then you would let the light out. We've talked about that before, so that it would scream out into the night. The night being symbolic of the world around us, the world that's in darkness because it's estranged from God. So that light is a conduit that pours through. But all Zechariah saw was just the menorah and the two olive trees and seeing how they were being fed. But is it not interesting that where we've left off and you the only think you get it, but remember, we're still, we just, we're not even 24 hours past Shavuot. You have the Tatamadi being left by the Messiah, who is the light, who is ascending into heaven, and he told them, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you? No, and glorify your Father 
who is in heaven. That was the whole point of what he was teaching them. The light shone through, glorifying the Father in heaven. And when you look at that oil, you look at how natural olive oil is. And we've got someone here who can tell me right or wrong, but I am taught that it invigorates the body. It increases energy of the vital spirits. And in our scriptures, we know it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit, of the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit of God. And as we see him work in the scriptures, we see something really new. Remember, we've hit our peak. We've hit Shavuot. We've gone from Mount Sinai to now this time on this mountaintop where at Mount Sinai, God came and stepped into Israel's life in a very real way, made covenant with them, and we have the law given. But now he has stepped into their life in another way. And remember, he had told them that he was going away, that they were to wait. They were to wait until they received the gift from God. When they received the gift from God, they would be empowered. Then they were to go out and be the light shining in the darkness. And that gift that came, we talked about it so much last week, that gift was the Ruach HaKodesh. And the Ruach HaKodesh came in a very special and a unique way. This was the major change. He didn't come and just be on them for a time and leave. He now came in and he indwelled them. And that's what the scriptures tell us. That we have this opportunity not to just be anointed by God, not to have the power for a moment or for a, a certain uh, something to be accomplished, but now there would be a personal indwelling. Now, I've got to tell you right here, if any of you are here tonight and you don't know about this, you have never entered into that relationship with the God of Israel, you've never entered in. You can't just say, oh, okay, then I'll take that to like you shop in a grocery store. You can't buy it. But God freely gives it to all who will open their hearts and say, I want the Son in me. I want to come to Him for forgiveness of my sin. I recognize Him as the Savior, as the Messiah. I see His work. I see how we see that He was born when God sent. I see how he did his ministry, did the miracles that showed the power of God was on him, in him and through him. He accomplished it all. He accomplished what man cannot do. He accomplished a raising from the dead. He had raised others, but raised himself. That took the power of God. That was the power seen by the Ruach HaKodesh. And now, as he's come into this time, the change has been made because that way to the heavenly has been open forever. The curtain broken, torn from the top to the bottom, pinned back by nails, his blood paving the way. We can go right into the presence of God, and the presence of God can come right down and dwell in your heart. And the beautiful thing is God says, when I give you my spirit, when you open my heart, and I give you my spirit, he dwells you forever. It doesn't come, doesn't go. This is forever. And as you take that knowledge into what I'm talking about now, and realize the oil, that's actually the fatness of the fruit of the olive tree. Again, the last pure result that you can get from all that has been done to this olive tree to its crop and what you have come out with. Do you remember what we brought in at Shabbat? Fruit. We brought in our first fruits, did we not? And if man wants to grow, if man wants to flourish, if you want to bear fruit like the olive tree, if you want that fruit in your life, you want to be able to produce fruit, well, let's compare it right here to this oil. Because you see this olive tree could grow on its own either. I've never seen a seed yet say, Hello, I am an olive tree. I will do what I want to do. I will grow up and be an olive tree. Just plant me in the ground. But do you know God put something into that seed? God's the instigator. He's the initiator. And he first has to implant or communicate to that seed in some way, you're an olive tree. You're something different. You're a flower. Whatever God has ordained, 
do you notice how they never get confused and they never morph and they never evolve into anything else? Bear sheet, the trees would bear fruit and the seeds would reproduce kind after kind after kind. And we see it here in the olive tree that God implanted into that seed what it is. God established that. He put it in the right soil or had man put it in the right soil. But then God gave the increase. He gave the rain. He gave the sunshine. And if he didn't give both and give them in the right, this would not grow and it would not flourish. And unfortunately, man tries to say, I'll be what I want to be. I'll grow on my own. I don't need God's rain. I don't need his sunshine. I can do it all by myself. And he'd do about as good as that seed will do in a packet, laying on the shelf, crying out, I am what they think they are. That when the spirit of God comes in, when he's implanted in your heart, it's as if that's your soil and God's planted in you. And now in that power, it is going to spring forth. Now it's going to come out and it's going to be nourished by the word of God. It's going to be nourished by spending time with God, by being near that menorah, by seeing the light. That's the light that we need, not the sun, S-U-N. We need the S-O-N, the sun, shine. And that's what will nourish us and what will help us to grow. And one of the points of this vision that Zachariah saw was to show him that there was a work that needed to be done. He was trying to rebuild, or he wasn't, but in this time, we've got Zerubbabel and we've got Yahshua, not Yeshua who led them into the promised land. This is a little later in time, but trying to rebuild the temple, trying to rebuild Jerusalem, having a lot of trouble going on. And God's speaking through the prophet Zechariah and telling him, it's not going to be done by man. This is something that's going to be done supernaturally. And in verse 7 of chapter 4, he says that he will bring out the top stone. Zechariah knows he's trying to build this temple. That's what the vision or, or what's going on in their lives. And in this vision, God is saying, I'm going to put the top stone on it. Now, typically, the capstone or the top stone, whatever you want to call it, that's the final piece of work of the project. It wraps up the entire project, and it's a significant milestone that it happens there. It's also very interesting that even the broken pieces are brought together and held in place by the capstone that now finishes it, completes it. It is now put together. And God saying, I'm going to do that. I'm going to supernaturally build this. And he was looking in his vision at the earthly temple that we know as often is true in visions and scripture, it's going beyond. It's going to a temple that will be in its perfection, that will be completed by the light, by the menorah, by Yeshua, who is the light of the world. So we're going past this time. We're looking, though, at that time to give us an example for what's coming. And so here we have that the work was so difficult that he said again, it's like a great mountain in front of you. Anyone ever felt like they've got a mountain in front of them and how hard it is to move a mountain? You think, okay, I'll climb up. And Bruce has already talked about us climbing up the mountain and reminded me of Masada in Israel and the snake path. We thought, try climbing that. <laughs> you can try to go around, but if it's a huge mountain, how long will it take you to go around? You can try to tunnel through. That takes some dynamite. You know, we can't do it. We can't move the mountain. But God told him, he said, in that vision, he showed him that mountain will become a plain. Now, a plane is flat. A plane is like this floor. There is nothing that you'd have trouble getting over in this. So the foundation had already been laid. Now the mountain has been moved, and God is saying, I'm going to finish this. But remember, we're looking at a natural to teach us something more spiritual that God is showing us. So when we look at what does a plane mean in Scripture, we see that it's representing the world and we see that what God is saying, that the world can't do it. It's before the mountain. But the kingdom of God is where we'll see this accomplished. When God brings his kingdom on earth, thy will be done in heaven, 
his will will be done on earth. That's when we're going to see. And how do I know this? Is Rochelle just putting the puzzle together the way she wants and looking at the picture she wants? And I'll tell you, no. Walk out the door and forget everything that Rochelle says about Rochelle. And just remember what the word of God says. Because we're given when and how this is going to happen in Deshiahu, Isaiah chapter 40. And I've taught you on that chapter before. If you don't remember, it starts out with comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. It was a time when they needed comfort. And if you're facing a mountain, it's a time you need comfort. Verse 4 of Yeshua of Isaiah chapter 40 says, Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. Let the uneven ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. We're talking the same language. God's saying, I'm going to smooth it all out. I'm going to take every obstacle out of the way. I'm going to put the capstone on it. And in Yeshua, Isaiah 40, we get the timing because verse 5 makes it clear. Verse 5, it says, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. All the flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know that old commercial when E.F. Hatton speaks, everybody listens? <laughs> this is the voice the entire world will listen to. And when the world is here and the glory of the Lord is shown, when it's being revealed on this earth, we know that's come the time that we call the millennial reign of Yeshua. Millennial because it's a thousand years, and we're told in Revelation and other places that it would uh, be for, for a thousand years. But Isaiah 40 is clearly talking about the messianic future. It's talking about the mir miraculous restoration of Israel. It's talking about the temple there, that the glory of the Lord will fill that temple. It's that temple that he's going to put that capstone on and that he's going to complete. But what is he telling them here and now? What are they to take away from this picture? What is this prophet to speak to the nation of Israel? Because they're still facing the mountain. And here we're seeing that God is saying, the power is here. The power. This is what's going to be represented. Yahshua being the high priest is going to take it to the people through the, their priestly duties. And Zerubbabel is like the prince, the governor, I mean, to say the, the civil leader. He just happened to be from the family of Judah, the family of Judah. Who else comes from the family of Judah? Why does that matter? You went all the way to the end. <laughs> Stop off at Delby. And then from the family of David comes this one who is going to be the governor of all of Israel. And suddenly we hear ourselves back with our prophet Yeshua because they're all talking about the same thing. They're just giving us different views of that diamond. And you're very familiar with Isaiah 9, 6, where it gives us all the wonderful names. He's wonderful counselor, prince of God, um, the everlasting father, prince of peace. But the next verse says the government's going to rest on his shoulders. And here it's tying in with this vision. It's tying in with everything that's been given to Zachariah, to Yeshua, to uh, to Zerubbabel through them is being given to Israel. But God understands and makes it very clear. He says, Israel, right now you're in a humble position. The imperial powers are beating you up. And I'm going to say, did I just read the news headlines of today? Israel is not head nation. She's not in charge of the world and leading the world. And she's suffering consequences right now that are very humbling and are hurting us deeply. Our hearts are crying. But God said, I'm going to remove that mountain. I'm going to raise up. You're going to be the flat plain that all are going to come up. And the temple is going to be complete. He's going to be the light and it'll take you all the way to the end. But we see he promised in 2 Shmuel, 2 Samuel, chapter 7, and especially verses 12 to 16, he said, Dabi, when you sleep with your fathers, I will raise one from your loins who will sit on this throne. And I'll ask Janet, because it's her favorite word, how long does he sit on that throne? Forever. You know, forever is a long time. It doesn't end. And what so excited me when I tied it and seeing the fruit and coming in, it should blow up in the first fruits and bringing this all in and the light of the world in it. I went to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6. 
verses 12 and 13. You've got to hear it. Then say to him, Adonai Sava'ot, the Lord of the army, says this. Behold, remember behold, you're going to wake up and not miss this. Behold, there is a man whose name is Samach. Anyone know what Samach means from our Hebrew? Branch. I heard it somewhere. Branch. For he will branch out. You may have sprouts. Same idea. He will branch out from where he is. He will build the temple of Adonai. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of Adonai. Remember, we're talking about who's building this temple. And he who will bear the majesty and sit and rule on his throne. So he will be a Kohen. He'll be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace will be between the two offices. Suddenly, we've got one revealed to Zechariah who is called the branch, who we think now a branch, you're thinking tree. You're getting on the right track for this vision. And that this one, for the first time, is not only going to be priest and bring all of that to its fulfillment, but is also going to be the government. Remember, the government will rest on his shoulders. But we know that he stepped in the role of being the high priest for us, the Kohen Gadol. And this is all coming together. And we go back to Prophet Yeshahu, Isaiah, who clarifies it for us also. Because in chapter 11, verse 1, Isaiah says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Yeshai. Yeshai is Jesse. So from Jesse's trunk, a shoot is going to shoot up. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. You know what an olive tree does? Chop that olive tree down. Just cut it down. Take the, the saw to it and cut it down. And just leave the stump. You know what this verse says? That a shoot is going to spring from that trunk. And do you know that's what happens to an olive tree? You don't kill the tree. You don't get rid of the tree. Out of that stump comes a new olive tree. And God put two olive trees by the menorah. He's tying in all of these visions, bringing it all to us together. It is so exciting. And here's where I'll bring it home and tell you that what Zerubbabel began, the true governor, he, Messiah, Mashiach, Samach, the servant of Jehovah, of God, he is the one who builds that millennial temple. He's the one that is going to finish it. He's going to put the capstone on. And that's supplied by the oil of the two trees, I believe is showing us because it's supernatural. It is the priesthood and the government by Yeshua that is going to be pouring in and keeping the menorah burning. Not man's priesthood, not man's government, but the media, the avenues that God is going to be using is the oil that in scripture, the oil represents as the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So by the Holy Spirit, this is going to be accomplished. That's the key. That's where the power is. Remember, we were so excited to get to Shavuot. We were so excited to look to that day. We were building up for a long time. And any of you who have not known who the Ruch HaKodesh is, not known him personally in your life, maybe scratching your head still and saying, what's the big deal? What's the excitement? But I'll tell you, if you've ever felt weak, if you've ever felt in need, this is where the power comes from. This is what it's all about. And when he said that he would bring that capstone, that he would bring that temple together, he promised that this temple that he's building will never be destroyed again. The oil will always pour in, the menorah will always be burning, and the temple will always be standing. And then he also told Zechariah in chapter 4, verse 10, he said, in my simple words, quickly I'll say, he says, don't despise small beginnings. And I think of that little drum, that little seed, putting that into the ground. Who would think that it would grow up into such a huge olive tree? Who would know what that meaning, that understanding is? But the next verse of, of, of Yeshua, of Isaiah 11, that I'm tying with Zechariah, 
verse two, verse one told us that that stem is going to shoot up out of the trunk. And verse two says, the spirit of the Lord, the real Kodesh, will rest on him, on Yeshua. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And we know these are the sevenfold workings of the Ruach HaKodesh. We know that this is what he does. He brings to us counsel and strength and knowledge in the fear of the Lord, wisdom and understanding, and even to rest on the Lord and stand in that awe, that reverence, is what we mean by the fear of the Lord. Not I'm afraid that we recognize, wow, look at whose presence we're in. Almighty God, his spirit, the creator of the universe, the creator of the universes of the universes. And I can go on and I don't know where to end because we don't know where it ends and it doesn't end. And this is what we're saying. And he tells them so clearly in verse six, he says, it's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit, says Adonai Sabaot. Remember the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies. Army sounds like mighty men. It sounds like war. But here it's not the army of a man. It's the army of the hosts of heaven. God has it all at his fingertips. He created it all. He calls it all. He tells it what to do, and it doesn't. And if you don't believe me, study the comments today. How do they know when to come? How does the sun know when to rise and when to set? How come we don't suddenly get too close one day? And too far away than it's safe. And I could go on and on every scientific level. There is an order and there is a master hand behind that order. And these are all divinely in, uh, appointed instruments that the Lord is using. And he's going to use it, bring it all together and cause us to come into that power. That his power can flow through us. And as we personalize it suddenly... We take the mountain and see it resolve, see it come down. It's not because we've gotten smart. It's not because we figured it out. We put the puzzle pieces together. But it's because his power is there. And when we see that he's talking about his spirit flowing to that congregation, that congregation is made up of both Jew and Gentile. That's the congregation that we see again in the millennial time. So we know those two trees are not Jews and Gentiles. That we see this coming in. That's why I think it has to be. Because you have others who say different views, but why I think it has to be that God is showing us Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 coming alive. Isaiah 11 being fulfilled. Zechariah and his dream. And as we go on and we see his vision, we see those 49 types of perfection speaking to us about the spirit of God entering in. Remember, that's what Shavuot was all about, because that second time was when God sent his spirit from heaven and it came in and it came in to the people. And suddenly they were able to do what they could not do. They could even speak in a language they had never studied. They could communicate clearly. And what were they communicating? Yeshua is Messiah. Yeshua is Savior. Yeshua died on the cross. We saw it with our eyes. He resurrected from the dead. We saw it with our eyes. We are your eyewitnesses. We saw him ascend into heaven, and now his spirit has come down, indwelling us, empowering us, and we can share. That's why Yeshua said, wait to go out and be my witnesses, because you've got to be and, and this power from on high has to come from you. And as Shavuot, we brought our first fruits to the Lord. We're bringing that harvest in. Do you know what they're bringing in? I told you last week, if you don't remember, figs, dates, pomegranates, grapes, and olives. The olive tree. Barley and wheat for the grains that are coming in. And that olive is a fruit, is in a group that's called Droops, D-R-U-P-E-S, droops or stone fruits. That's what they're called. It's related to the mangoes, to the cherries, to the peaches, to the almonds and the pistachios. Even pistachio is a fruit. I didn't realize that. That fleshy tree fruit, it contains a shell that covers the seed. And with the pistachio, we kill off that, that shell to get to the delicious seed, do we not? 
But with the other, it's the opposite. And we eat that outside and we come down to that seed in the olive. So it really, it really is. It's one of the stone fruits. It fits into that category. So Zechariah's vision seeing the pure oil of the fruit representing the Ruch HaKodesh, we are seeing the first fruits are to come into the power of the Ruch HaKodesh and then everything else stems from that. Remember the lamp didn't burn on its own. It burned because of the olive oil. It first had to receive the power to burn. Then it's able to burn. And that's what we're seeing for us. Under grace, we now have the power to burn. And then when we realize, and how many of you have said, I couldn't do that for God. I'm me. I can't do that. I can't go speak like Brutus. I can't get up there like Rochelle. I can't even know. I haven't afraid to open my front door now because I'm afraid he's going to be on the other side of the door. <laughs> and God says, what's your problem? I didn't ask you to do it. I put my spirit in you. I poured the olive oil in. That's the first phrase. Now you just let it out. Well, I think we can all do that. And that's what we're seeing. Remember that that olive oil that invigorates and increases energy and stimulates the spirits of the body. That's what the Ruach HaKodesh is doing. When you see me get all excited up here, it's the Ruach HaKodesh. It's <laughs> inside of me getting all excited. I got to just let them out. <laughs> and when man grows, when man flourishes, when man bears fruit like the olive trees, you know what his fruit looks like? It looks like this. Love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Mount Sinai, first time, when they're, they're dwelling with the, the Spirit entering into covenant with them in a different way where it's written on stone, is called law. And you know what God said about this fruit? He said, all these fruits that I just made, there's no law against these. No law. And he's going to empower you to develop those fruits. You don't do it. I think I'm very, very well aware of how I don't develop these. <laughs> we all see our human side. That when we're in the spirit, empowered by the spirit, and we allow the spirit to do his work in us and through us, then all kinds of fruit develops. And I think you'll even be surprised at yourself when God gives you a grace, a love, a joy. Do you know you can even have joy in the midst of sorrow? And if you want living proof, I don't want to embarrass two precious girls in this room tonight, but I know where they are. Their beloved is in heaven with the Lord now. And you don't see them sitting here. I'm sure they have their moments of crying, and that's right, too. There's not a thing wrong with that. But how could they be here tonight? How could they have smiles on their faces? Because God's filling them with his joy, the joy that goes beyond understanding, the joy that is not dependent on our circumstances. That's what God is doing. And those fruits will always, always come from God. They are never self-effort. They are never the human reforming itself and finally succeeding. We'll never get there, folks. <laughs> we just won't. But when we put our faith in the God who said, I'll indwell you in his spirit, then we even see Dr. on John 15, suddenly we understand that where he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Now, the branch doesn't need to do anything but cling to the vine and get fed from the vine. And then the fruit develops. And that's what we see in living action here. That's what's happening. And so many times we were told to bring in our first fruits. It's not just the Shavua. We bring in the, the first fruits of grain, of olive oil, of new wine, of honey, of sheep wool, of fruit, and of our herds and our flocks. And I can give you scriptures to back all of these up. So if you want the scriptures later, come see me. But that tells me I don't care if you're in January or 
April or October, there's going to be a first fruits. There's going to be something the Lord is developing. And I think the key there for us to see is is a constant, is constant within us too. But again, lest you're sitting there thinking, what have I got? What can I produce? Realize it's not what you've got. It's not what you bring to the table at all. You can come with nothing. Because really, when we face ourselves before our God, that's all we've got is nothing. But when you see who he is. And let me take you real quickly through who the Ruach Pekodesh is. Who is empowering us? What does this really mean? Why were we so excited? Why did we look forward to Shavuot to remember that time when the Holy Spirit let them on fire? And what does that mean for us today? I'll take you to Ephesians 1, verse 3, where it says, Praise be God and our Father of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, who in the Messiah has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven. He didn't say, I'll give you one, and I'll give you two, and I'll give you this one, and I'll give them that one. He said that he's blessed us all with every spiritual blessing in heaven. And when we keep reading, we find out that he's made us his sons and his daughters that were adopted in. And lest you not know what adoption means, it means you're the heir. It means you get what comes down when there's a change. And, of course, we never lose our parents. We never lose our God that we can in to all those riches that are ours. That adopted child doesn't live in poverty and outside. He gets to be brought into the house and he gets everything. And then we're told that when you become his son, when you become his daughter, and that's what we're talking about, that's how you get the Holy Spirit within. You know, there were those who fall, all fall around, they saw him working by the power of the Holy Spirit, they wanted to buy it. I wanna learn how to do that. That's magic, teaching your secrets, I'll pay you. You can't do that. And shall Paul let him know very clearly, you cannot buy it. But the Lord so freely give. You open up your heart, become my son, my daughter, and I will indwell you. My spirit will come in. And that's where we read in verse 11 of Ephesians 1 that in him we have this inheritance. And he says, when you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit, with the Ruach HaKodesh of the promise, who is the first installment of inheritance. You know what that means? It gets better. <laughs> There's more to come. Now, I'll tell you honestly, what comes is literally out of this world, and that's where you'll receive it. But we need nothing more in this world than to be sealed by the Spirit, to have the power of the Spirit within us. And he tells us in from the, the original language, we know that the, the real of the code is just like the engagement ring. Now, to the Jewish mind, Engagement is as good as marriage. You break the engagement, you have to have a seal of, uh, a, um, of divorce. It's, it's over. There has to be a break and it has to be shown legally. The roof of the Kodesh steals us, never leaves us, all the way till we're home in heaven, receiving that inheritance we were just told about. And he says in verse 19, his power, the real Kodesh, his power toward us who believe in accordance with the working of the strength of the Holy Spirit, the real Kodesh's might. What do we see of his might? Do you know who is this raised Yeshua from the dead? The, the Spirit of God. That's pretty powerful. You think you need any more power than something that's able to raise one into life? What could be more? <laughs> what could be more? So we see that we have that power in us, for us, through us, to produce and to keep us until the day that we're home receiving all the rest of that inheritance. Now, again, I'm still going to tell you who the real Kodesh is. I'll take you all the way back to the beginning, a very good place to start. I'll take you back to Bereshit, to Genesis 1 and verse 2. And in 1 and verse 2, we have that the Ruach, which means breath or wind or spirit, that this Ruach was hovering over the face of the earth. 
This is the recreation God is giving us of how he made this earth inhabitable for us. In verse 1, we've seen before, I've taken you through it, that Elohim, there is God the Father and Barah, Bar is the Son, that God the Father and God the Son were in the creation of the earth, and unless you wonder, well, where was the Spirit? Verse 2 tells us, he was hovering over. But you know what else that word from our Hebrew means? Brooding. You ever seen a mama hen brooding over her chicks? <laughs> now you know what brooding means. The Holy Spirit was brooding over this earth as if in essence he was preparing it for the creative act of God the Father and God the Son to bring it into the complete picture that we are given. And that's how we know he's not just the wind. Remember I told you when the wind came, it was symbolic that the wind blew so hard that nobody got knocked over and the candles didn't even go out, <laughs> okay? Because that's just a symbolic word. But this is telling us that this is really the spirit of God. And by the time we finish with our second verse, that's all, all the rest of the Bible to go, we already have our triune God presented to us. We already see God as Father, as Son, and as Ruh, because it's just Holy Spirit. It's amazing how they all three are one and yet three distinct. And then we hear the psalmist say in, in Tehillim 104, verse 30, You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. I think the psalmist is telling us exactly what happened in Bereshit 1 and 2 and following. The Spirit of God had a role in creating mankind. The real Kodesh of God has made me. He's made you. He has put breath in us. And the scripture says the breath, the Nashana, of the Almighty, of the Shaddai, the one who's a nourisher. And the nurture, that's what gives me life. And you know who said that? One of the very first people we know about, the oh, Job. And don't think he's halfway through your original covenant. He was probably at the time of Abraham or slightly before him. And he knew, he had caught on, he had did God teach him that the spirit put breath into him and he became a living being. Does that not sound like the very beginning again? Am I not back in Bereshit in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2? We have there... It's all saying the same thing. This is the power of God. It's the power of God to bring life. It's the power of God to sustain life. It's the power of God to keep life. And then I hear the psalmist also say in chapter 139 and 7, where can I go from thy spirit? Where can I flee from thy presence? God's presence, God's power. God's spirit in our Hebrew are synonymous. And I want to make it very, very clear to each and every one of you, in order to receive the power of God, you do not need a religious formula. That's not how you get it. You need a relationship with a person. You can't have a relationship with a rock. You can't have a relationship with an inanimate object. And God never says, here's the formula. Remember, he said, I'm pouring it in. All you do is say, I want it. You just open the door and he comes in. And we see that the Holy Spirit, the Ruf Kodesh, is a divine person. We see him referred to as a person, not an it. Don't make any mistakes. Don't call him binary. Don't call him it. He is a person. He is equal to the Father and the Son. They are all, that's why a triangle is the best picture because all three are equal. We see a sign to him that there's wisdom and there's knowledge and might and will and there's personal activities. He speaks and he reveals and he comforts. He can be grieved and he can even be lied to, not that he falls for the lie. Those who lied to the birth of Kodesh found themselves dead. Actually, they didn't find themselves dead, but the people around them certainly did. They were, it was over. And I'll take you one step further. I'll take you to David. David said, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Adonai spoke. And in the very next, and this is recorded for us in 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 and 3. The spirit of Adonai spoke, the God of Israel said. Wow. Did you catch that? They're equal. The God of Israel, 
Do you believe in the God of Israel? You have no problem believing in the spirit of God. They are equal and yet they are different. The Ruach Kodesh was sent by the Father. That means he's distinct from the Father. He convicts us of sin. He's the one that makes you feel, uh-oh, that was not the right thing to do. Yes, he develops the good fruit, but he helps chop off the bad fruit also. And he regenerates. That's why he should have said to Demas, not the moon. He said to him, you have to be born again of the spirit. That's how you get this life. You want to live life abundantly? You want to have power in your life? You want to watch your mountains become plains? You want to be able to produce fruit? You want to feel joy and love and peace and all else that I mentioned? It's by the Spirit. That's the whole secret. And it's no secret. He lays it out and he makes it very clear. And he identifies so that when the Holy Spirit is indwelling you, God, the God of Israel, the God who has kept Israel alive in 2024, this is within you. And it's not my ideas right here in Ephesians 2.22. It says, and in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Good. He lives by his spirit in you. You become the temple. You're in the sukkah. And this time, it's not flimsy. <laughs> Hallelujah. This Kodesh we see in scriptures, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, and he is eternal. There is no end. He is sovereign. He restrains the evil in this world today as bad as it is. When he removes himself, you're going to see him, forgive me, but there's no other way to see it, say it except all hell will be let loose. And if you think it's bad today, then just stay around. Don't invite the Holy Spirit in and don't come to believe and don't come to accept and you can find out just how bad it is. But even in the tribulation, where it is the worst this world has ever seen, even there, the roof of Kodesh is going to come and he's going to seal people in salvation. He's going to bring them to salvation and he's going to fill them and enable them. They're sealed so that they can't have their lives taken from them until they've accomplished what God has given them to do. There's power again. They're not going to be able to do it, but they're going to be like Superman. They can stop the bullets because the spirit of God has sealed them and protected them, and it will be miraculous. And if you think she's in the Shavana, well, I'll take you back to the time Yeshua walked on this earth. Lazarus, come forth. And he's the one that came out of the grave. You know why he called him by name? Because if he just simply stood in front of graves and said, come forth, they all would have come out. <laughs> so he had a name. He had to be specific. But that's our God. He pinpoints it. And he does it exactly. And the power is for each and every one. Because God is able to give it to everyone. He can divide it in that way that I have the spirit and you can have the spirit. This is for everyone. And then he equips you for the work that he wants you to do. So he asks you to do something. But then he doesn't leave you on your own to do it. And he doesn't say, figure it out. He says, I'll do it for you. Just open the door. Just let me go. <laughs> The Ruach of Kodesh came to the, to the town that he made and walked with Yeshua. Remember, we talked about how they must have missed him. And the Ruach of Kodesh brought back to their minds. He reminded them what Yeshua had taught them that they didn't quite get because they didn't have the whole picture. We get the end from the beginning, so it's easier for us. He taught them. He reminded them. He helped them in their weaknesses. He energized them. He says, I'm the paraclete. You know what that word means? I'm the comforter that comes alongside. He tends to us, he comforts us, he guides us, he counsels us, he intercedes for us, he advocates for us. What more do you want? What more do you need? I've covered every area I can think of because he's in every area and he's a real person. That's why the scriptures say you can grieve him. You know how you grieve him? I don't want you. Go away. Go away. I want to listen to you. I don't want you in your life. And he's grieved. He's heartbroken. You can resist him. You can even blast him his name, but he doesn't go away. And I'm going to fly through his names. I'm not going to take time. I can give you scriptures for all of this. But I'm going to fly through his names. He's Hogmalit. That means the comforter, the helper. He is Ruach Alam. That means eternal spirit. 
He is Ruach HaKadosh, Kesher Dibur, the Holy Spirit of Promise. He is Ruach Adonai, the Spirit of Adonai. Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God. Ruach Elohim Chaim, the Spirit of the Living God. Ruach Adonai Yehovah, the Spirit of the Lord God. Ruach HaMashiach, the Spirit of the Messiah. Ruach HaAmet, the Spirit of Truth. Ruach HaChokhmah, the Spirit of Wisdom. Ruach Yeshua, the Spirit of Yeshua Jesus. Ruach Adonai, the Spirit of Adonai, the breath of the Lord. And he's Ha Ruach, the Spirit. Breath, soul, wind. I can give you scriptures for every single one. And I think we've covered, but I don't know because we, probably not. We've probably missed the name or somewhere. But in my closing, I want to bring you back to that farmer. I want to bring you back to the fruit. That farmer wants to grow a crop. He's desiring to have fruit. Whatever the crop is, he's desiring to have it. But he doesn't have the relationship with the fruit. He can't do that. He has to have the relationship with the plant. He's got to nurture that plant. He's got to sow the seed. He's got to tend to it. He's got to water it and fertilize it. And he's waiting all the time for the fruit. But without the plant, there is no fruit. And if you desire the fruit of the roof of Kodesh, you've got to relate to him as a person. You can't just jump to the fruit. You've got to relate to him. And he's got to be able to nurture. He's got to be able to, to enrich your soil and to water it and to give it that sunshine. And what I'm talking about again is that divine manifestation of the person of Yeshua who wants to enter into your life as your Messiah, as your Savior. When he has done that, when he's real in your life as a person, because you're sure you could see him as a person if he lived at that time. And we will see him in that human form that he took on. For all of eternity, we will see him with nail-pierced hands and feet and we will know the high cost of our salvation. But to have the fruit, first you have to have a relationship. How do you have a relationship? You simply, the same way you do with someone today, you talk to them. You open your heart to them. And then you get into their word. Learn what they have to say by getting into the word of God. And as that nurtures, you will see develop in you the fruit. The Ruach HaKodesh doing his work in you. What an amazing, I, I what do I call it? What God thought, how he said, I'm bigger than all creation, but I want to create what I can love, and I want it to love me back. So I'm going to give that free will. I'm going to give that human being made in my image the choice to choose me or reject me, but I'm going to do everything I can to bring that one to want me to come to know that I can love them, they can love me, and the crescendo, I'm going to put me in them, and he does it in the spirit. Wow, what a plan, what a God, what a relationship, and if you don't have it, what are you missing? So, I gotta bring it to close, but I gotta give you the opportunity. If you don't have this real in your life, if you can't say, I know what she's talking about, then simply at this moment, say, God of Israel, I want that fruit. I wanna come through your son because you said the only way to the Father is through the Son. Come into me and light me on fire because I guarantee you he will. Let's close in prayer. El Shaddai, our nourisher, our nurturer, almighty God. How we praise the God of Abraham, Yisrael, and Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the same today as the miracle working God in their lives. And you're working miracles in our lives today, and you are the keeper of Israel. 
and we know she is only there because you are real and you are true and you are faithful and you keep your word. And how we thank you that as you wanted a relationship with Israel, you want a relationship with every single human created in your image. And Lord, as we take this time and this opportunity for any in this room who have not entered into a personal relationship with you, we pray, those of us who have, and that's quietness of our heart for those who have not, to simply say, yes, I want that relationship. I want to feel that love. I want that power. I want to be that cared for. I want to be one with you in relationship. I want to know the God of Israel, and I want to know my home one day is in heaven with you. All this, Lord, you promise when we just simply say yes. The Lord may any who me at this moment say yes. May they give you that heart, and may they quickly know the joy of their salvation. Hallelujah for those of us who have it, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. It never stops. It never leaves. It's never gone that we are saved today, tomorrow, and forever. Thank you for this plan, magnanimous plan. Can't think of a better word. You are awesome and amazing. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for tending to us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us a fun of life here and forever. And we praise you for it and thank you all the day long. In the holy name of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Yehovah of Israel, of the Ruach HaKodesh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.